In this video we are going to talk about measurements. Previously we have seen that the outcome of a measurement, rare cases notwithstanding, is completely random. We illustrated this with a loaded coin. Catching a spinning coin and thus performing a measurement has a random outcome. The probability of whether heads or tails comes up depends on the load and we can distort this probability even to the point where there is a 100% chance of one side coming up. This is the rare case in which the result of the measurement is not probabilistic. The same is true for multiple quantum bits. The only difference is that there is now more than two outcome. You can think of a system like this as a loaded die whose faces represent every outcome a series of coin tosses could have. The strange thing about this is that qubits are physically separable systems, just like coins, yet certain states of multi-qubit systems cannot be mathematically described as groups of individual qubits. But there is still more to learn about measurements. For example, so far we only talked about what happens if every single bit of a multi-qubit system is measured, but not about cases when we only measure a few qubits out of them. And last but not least, we have not talked about how a measurement changes a system and what the effects of different kinds of measurements are. The main point of this video is that in quantum mechanics the measurement usually changes the system. Performing a measurement is like catching a coin. The moment we catch it, its state abruptly and randomly changes to either heads or tails. Once we caught it, we remove the randomness from the equation. We could look at the face of the resting coin and thus measure it over and over again, but we would get the same result every time and the state of the coin would not change. However, there is one exception. If there were a 100% chance of the coin flip yielding one side, then catching the coin would change nothing. That side would come up with absolute certainty, and regardless of how many more times we would look at the coin afterwards, it would stay the same. Indeed, this is what we mean by a measurement usually changing the state. Mathematicians have an entire family of operations like this. Operations which yield the same result regardless of how many times we perform them in a consecutive order. These are called projections. Think of them as projecting an image or a shadow onto a surface, or flattening a three-dimensional object into two dimensions. Regardless of how many dimensions or what kind of surface we talk about, performing these operations twice is the same as performing them once. This property can be used as a definition of projection, which is simpler than enumerating all the directions and surfaces we could project onto. For example, if a three-dimensional toad were sitting on a road, we could run it over with a steamroller, creating a perfectly flat two-dimensional toad. Putting the steamroller in reverse, and running the toad over again would change nothing. It wouldn't get any flatter than it already is, and therefore, this counts as a projection. Since the same thing is also true for a measurement, they are also projections. If we measure a qubit coin twice, we always get the same result the second time, as we did the first time. The reason why this is interesting is because projections are irreversible, or at least irreversible almost all the time. The only exception is the so-called identity operation, when we do absolutely nothing. Naturally, doing nothing once does exactly the same thing as doing nothing twice, so this should count as a projection. But this pathological case aside, every other time you perform a projection, you are doing something that is mathematically irreversible, meaning you are losing information. You cannot restore the three-dimensional toad after you ran it over, because you no longer know how tall it was. Similarly, after seeing the shadow of a bird on a hill, you can tell how high the bird was flying. The same thing is true for measurements and catching qubit coins. The moment you catch the coin, you erase the load and the phase information. You cannot tell afterwards whether the coin flip yielded a head because there was a 100% chance of that happening anyway, or because there was only a 1% chance and you got lucky. Flipping the coin twice in a row gives you no additional information, as a classical coin would, because the very act of flipping the coin means changing the load in a predetermined way. So how does the state of a qubit coin change during a measurement? As you may notice, the outcome is exactly one of the distinct states our measurement is looking for. For example, we can distinguish a photon with horizontal polarization from a photon with vertical polarization, so we can construct a measurement that decides which is which. Using this experimental setup on any photon with arbitrary polarization, we suddenly and randomly change the polarization and force the photon to become either horizontally or vertically polarized. Now some of you may be wondering whether we could construct more than one kind of measurement. For example, could we rotate our polarizers? And the answer is most certainly yes. The interesting thing about this situation is that for some measurements the outcome is a superposition, but for others it isn't. 
For example, you can distinguish between any two photon polarizations as long as the planes of these polarizations meet at a 90 degree angle. 45 degree and minus 45 degree polarization might both be superpositions from the point of view of linear and vertical polarizations, but you can construct a measurement that can distinguish between these two polarizations with 100% accuracy. All you have to do is rotate your setup by 45 degree. From the point of view of that measurement, linear and vertical polarizations are both superpositions. In summary, superposition is in the eye of the beholder and what you count as superposition depends on what measurements you are planning to perform. So we have seen that the measurement changes the measured system. But what will the outcome be if someone else performs a measurement and that person uses a different set of distinct states than we do? What happens when someone sitting on a merry-go-round catches a coin or someone using a rotated setup measures the polarization of a photon? The answer, the outcome will be one of the distinct states that this measurement is looking for. For example, if someone uses a setup rotated by 45 degree to measure the polarization of an arbitrary photon, then she will change the polarization to either 45 degree or minus 45 degree, depending on what state she finds the photon in. Repeating this measurement yields the same result for her over and over again, since every measurement is a projection. But if we try to measure this photon after she's done with it, we will have a 50-50% chance of finding it in either a vertically or horizontally polarized state. After that first measurement, regardless of how many times we perform our measurement, we find the same polarization over and over again, meaning our measurement overwritten the original polarization. We can play this game back and forth as many times as we want. Every single time we perform a new type of measurement, we get a different result. But the change only happens the first time we perform a different measurement, after that, repeating the same measurement over and over again changes nothing. This phenomenon is absolutely crucial for quantum key distribution, which is the field of exchanging passwords. Since the act of a measurement changes the state of a photon, the presence of an eavesdropper can be detected. If the quantum channel is secure, and we see no sign of tampering, then the shared passwords can be used to encrypt messages. But if the quantum channel was wiretapped, the passwords can be discarded. So far, we have learned about measuring a single qubit. Before we proceed to multi-qubit measurements, let's recap. First, the outcome of a measurement is usually probabilistic, just like when we catch a spinning coin. Secondly, the measurement changes the state of the measured system, much like how catching a spinning coin stops it from spinning. Thirdly, if we repeat the same measurement over and over again, we get the same result, much like how after we caught the coin glancing over it over and over, does not change which side came up. And finally, the change we introduce depends on what kind of measurement we perform. The outcome will always be one of the distinct states the measurement can identify. This also means that the first time we perform a different measurement, we get a random result. Since there are many sets of states that can be distinguished from each other with 100% accuracy, any of those can form the basis of a measurement setup. Now let's take a closer look at what happens if we measure the state of a composite system. If we have several quantum bits and measure all of their values, we get a probabilistic outcome. The state of the system after the measurement becomes one of the states that our measurement was looking for. More precisely, the very same state that we found the system in. For example, if we have two qubit coins in a Bell state where the outcome of the flips are correlated 100% of the time, and there is a pi phase difference between the two possibilities, then catching the two coins and looking at them can yield either two cat zeros or two cat ones. After we code the coins, they remain in the same state we found them in. If we found two cat ones, then no matter how many more times we look at the coins, we will see two cat ones and vice versa. The act of the measurement changed the state since it erased the phase and overwritten the probability. If we were to perform a different kind of measurement, looking for a set of different distinct multi-qubit states, then we would find the answer as one of those states. Calculating the probabilities in this case may require some higher math, so we will not talk about that here. Luckily, changing the type of the measurement is quite rare in quantum informatics. We are just trying to determine the qubit values almost all the time. So far so good, but what happens if we only measure a few qubits instead of all of them? This may be necessary for some quantum algorithms, one example is quantum teleportation. The charts that we use to visually represent the state will be immensely helpful in answering that question. If we put the qubits in the order that we want to perform the measurement, then we can simply discard one side of the graph 
and keep the one that corresponds to the bit value that was the outcome of our measurement. For example, if we have three qubits in a state like this and we perform a measurement on the first qubit, there is a 75% chance that we will find the first qubit to be cat0 and a 25% chance of finding it in a cat1 state. If we find it in a cat0 state, we can simply discard the side of the graph that was below the bar corresponding to cat1. Now the state of the entire system is described by that chart. The total width of what remains counts as 100%, and since the bar representing the first qubit is 100% black, no matter how many more times we perform a measurement on the first qubit, we are going to find it in a cat0 state. But the rest of the probabilities may have changed significantly. In this example, if we would have found the first qubit to be cat1, then there would have been no chance of finding the second qubit in a cat1 state. But now that the first measurement yielded cat0, this is no longer the case. We can repeat this process for the second measurement performed on the second qubit. Again, the relative width gives us the probabilities. Let's say we find the second qubit in a cat0 state, meaning that we can get rid of another side of the chart, and any chance of finding the third qubit to be cat1 is now gone. Again, after the second measurement, the width of the remaining part of the chart counts as 100% probability. This is another reason why we constructed our chart the way we did. It is invaluable in determining the outcome of a partial measurement, a determination that otherwise would require complex calculations. So this concludes our introduction to measurements. In this video, we have learned that the measurement changes the state of a quantum system and the way it changes depends on the kind of measurement we perform. The outcome is invariably one of the states the measurement is looking for. In case of multi-qubit systems, we can determine the state after the measurement by discarding one side of the chart. The width of the remaining chart will represent a 100% chance after the measurement, and based on this, we can determine the probabilities of finding the rest of the qubits in certain states. Thanks for watching, goodbye.